Strangest Gods and Idols in the Bible Number 1. The Nehushtan The Bronze Serpent Its Origins and Fate Following their deliverance from Egypt, the people began to complain to God about the conditions of their lives, and as a direct response, God dispersed among them fiery serpents. Many of the people ended up passing away, and many more were dying. Numbers 21, 4-9, New American Standard Bible Then they set out from the Mount Hor, by the way of the Red Sea, to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient because of the journey. So the people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up from Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we are disgusted with this miserable food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Intercede with the Lord that he will remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and put it on a flagpole, and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten and looks at it will live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on the flagpole, and it came about that if a serpent bit someone and he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. The difficult trek that was designed to bypass the hostile Edom frustrated the Israelites, and as a result, they reverted to their favorite complaint against God and Moses. Why have you led us up from Egypt to die in the wilderness? For forty years God had preserved them. They were protected by God for a period of forty years. It would be inappropriate at this moment to presume the worst about him. So since they were determined to complain about dying, God gave them something to actually complain about. He sent poisonous snakes. The carpet viper is a highly poisonous viper known from Africa and the Middle East. Thus, a likely candidate. Other suggestions include the puff adder and sand viper, neither of which is as lethal as the carpet viper. Even among miracles, this was unusual. There was no immediate logical connection between merely glancing at a serpent mounted on a pole and the ability to live, or refusing to look and dying. But God commanded that such an unusual thing be used to bring salvation to Israel. This is interesting, as we see in Genesis and Revelation, the serpent is frequently employed as a symbol of evil throughout the Bible. Many years later, something strange happened. In the time between Moses and Hezekiah, the Israelites began worshipping the fiery serpent, Moses made out of bronze, 2 Kings 18.4. This shows us how easy it is for us to take the things of God and twist them into idolatry. Although the bronze serpent was referenced in relation to Hezekiah's reforms, it is possible that the worship of Nehushtan had been occurring prior to his reign. When Hezekiah took power, Judah was almost completely ruled by Assyria. His reign was one of great reform. He led a campaign against all kinds of idolatry, destroying even the high places and the bronze serpent from Numbers 21. He gave it the name Nehushtan, which means a bronze thing in Hebrew. Hezekiah was the best king of Judah because he put his trust in the Lord God more than any other king. 2 Kings 18.4 Amplified Bible He removed the high places of pagan worship, broke down the images, memorial stones, and cut down the Asherim. He also crushed the pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days the Israelites had burned incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan, a bronze sculpture. Even though it is easy to see how something that brought miraculous healing could become an object of worship, it was still blatant disobedience to God's commands. The bronze serpent was God's method of deliverance during the incident 
recorded in number 21. There is not the slightest hint that God ever intended for it to have any further application. It's interesting to note that the literal translation of the word Nehushtan is piece of brass. It's possible that Hezekiah gave it the name Nehushtan so that people would be reminded that it was just a piece of brass. It did not contain any power at all. Even in the situation described in Numbers 21, it was God who brought about healing, not Nehushtan. A powerful lesson for all of us to learn from Nehushtan is that even good things and good people have the potential to become idols in our lives. All of our adoration, praise and thanksgiving should be directed solely towards God. Nothing else, regardless of its amazing history, is worthy. Jesus indicated that this bronze serpent was a foreshadowing of him. The serpent, a symbol of sin and judgment, was lifted up from the earth and put on a tree, which was a symbol of a curse. The raised and cursed serpent was a picture of Jesus, who takes away sin from anyone who looks to him in faith, just like the Israelites had to look to the symbol in the desert. God saved the people by sending the bronze snake. There's no sign that God ever planned for it to be used again. Number 2. Golden Calf The Golden Calf This idol is strange as it was created by a man that was a righteous spiritual leader. In Exodus 32, there was an unusual event that happened after the Israelites escaped from Egypt. According to the Bible, God miraculously parted the Red Sea, allowing the Israelites to pass through while the Egyptians were pursuing them. Once the Israelites had safely crossed the other side, God caused the sea to close back up, drowning the pursuing Egyptians. During Moses' absence on Mount Sinai, retrieving the Ten Commandments, the Israelites committed an action that is commonly seen in the Old Testament. They became irritated. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up from Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Exodus 32, 1 Moses was on the mountain for a long time, receiving instructions from the Lord. Forty days and forty nights, in fact. That was apparently too long for the Israelites. They were tired of waiting and were impatient. They despised the one whom God used to deliver them from slavery. This Moses, we don't know what happened to him. They also demanded that Aaron create an idol to lead them in Moses's and the Lord's place, a rejection of the first two commandments and a repudiation of their vow to obey the Lord. Exodus 32, 2-4 New American Standard Bible. Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then he took the gold from their hands and fashioned it with an engraving tool and made it into a cast metal calf. And they said, This is your God, Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Tragically, Aaron listened to them and told them to bring him gold, which he fashioned into the image of a calf. This decision holds significance as the Egyptians and Canaanites, who were the initial occupants of the land promised to Israel, worshipped calf-shaped deities. As a result, Israel scorned the great I Am who had rescued them and instead worshipped a false god of the nations. The praise that was due to God alone was bestowed upon a gold statue. Exodus 32, 5-6 Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So the next day they got up early and offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink, and got up to engage in lewd behavior. Aaron declared that they would hold a festival to the Lord, and the people brought burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. 
It's important to remember that the people performing sacrifices to this idol referred to it as the Lord, despite the fact that the true Lord had prescribed different practices. Religious synthesis always leads to false religion. When idol tree is mixed with Christianity, Christianity is no longer the same. People sat down to eat and drink before getting up to party. They were clearly not having a harmless celebration. Its foundation was rejection of the true God, and the party most likely incorporated corrupt cultic practices from other nations, such as drunkenness and immorality. Paul quotes this verse when he warns the Corinthians, Don't become idolaters. Moses had been on the mountain for days in God's presence and was completely unaware of what was going on. God informed Moses that Moses' people, notice he did not say my people, had acted corruptly and had quickly abandoned God in favor of idol worship. The Lord declared that they were a stiff-necked people who would be destroyed. After all, he would be able to turn Moses into a great nation instead. Moses didn't want to become the patriarch of a new nation without the Israelites. Instead, he pleaded with God to spare them from destruction. He didn't make the appeal based on their worthiness, but on God's reputation and character. Moses descended the mountain carrying the two tablets inscribed with God's writing. While Joshua was on the mountain with Moses, he heard commotion coming from the Israelite camp and mistakenly thought an enemy invasion caused it. But Moses was wiser. Moses was filled with anger when he witnessed the people dancing around the calf. This led him to break the tablets in disappointment as Israel had broken the covenant made by God with them in a short span of time. The Israelites were made to drink the powder of a burnt calf, which was a consequence of their sin. Exodus 32, 21-24 Then Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you, that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord burn. You know the people yourself, that they are prone to evil. For they said to me, Make a God for us who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. So I said to them, Whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. Then they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. Moses had a confrontation with his brother Aaron, who was tasked with leading Israel to know and obey God. However, Aaron led them into committing a serious sin. Instead of taking responsibility for his actions, Aaron shifted the blame to the people, as if they coerced him into it. Then he made this absurd claim. When I threw the gold into the fire, this calf came out. As a result, he falsely implied that the idol was created supernaturally. Moses recognized that the people were out of control. Despite the fact that he had confronted them with their sin, many remained unrepentant. So he exclaimed, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. When the Levites gathered around him in response, Moses dispatched them to carry out God's judgment on those who continued to practice idolatry and immorality. As a result, 3,000 men were killed within a short period of time. Sin is no joke. It brings death. The next day, Moses reminded the people of their sin and declared that he would intercede with God on their behalf. This is followed by another remarkable example of intercessory prayer in the Bible. Moses confessed the people's sin and pleaded for their forgiveness. If God refused to forgive them, Moses requested that God destroy him instead of them. He was ready to give his life for this ungrateful, sinful people. Number 3. Artemis Artemis was a goddess worshipped in the ancient world. According to Greek mythology, she was the twin sister of Apollo and was considered the goddess of hunting, wilderness, and the protector of unmarried women. The Artemis referred to in the Book of Acts was not the same as the Greek goddess of mythology who shares her name. 
Rather, she was a localized goddess specific to the region of Ephesus, known as Diana in Latin. Her temple in Ephesus was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The deity known as Ephesian Artemis was worshipped as a queen of heaven, with a focus on fertility and the safeguarding of childbearing. Numerous images of her have been discovered through excavation. In the temple, numerous priests and priestesses conducted animal sacrifices. It is unclear if the priestess practiced ritual prostitution. But regardless, the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus was a well-liked destination for tourists during the Roman era. A unique mythology sprang up around the origin of Artemis worship. The account is hinted to be the city clerk of Ephesus. Acts 19.35 New American Standard Bible After quieting the crowd, the town clerk said, Men of Ephesus, what person is there after all who does not know what the city of the Ephesians is guarding of the temple of the great Artemis and of the image which fell down from the sky? One commonly sold item to tourists is a tiny Artemis shrine, an enclosed cup with a small female figure inside. The worshippers are advised that they can take this portable shrine anywhere in the world and worship Artemis in front of it. Paul spent years in Ephesus and performed extraordinary miracles there, as the gospel made inroads into territory claimed by Artemis. The stage was set for a confrontation with the spiritual forces of darkness. As the followers of Artemis noticed the difference Paul's preaching was having in their city, there arose a great disturbance about the way. Acts 19.23 About that time a major disturbance occurred in regard to the way. In the center of Artemis worship, in a city known for paganism, immorality and greed, the light of Jesus Christ shone brightly. Despite the enemy's intimidations, the church thrived. Baal Who was Baal? Baal was the name of the god who was worshipped throughout Canaan and Phoenicia in ancient times. During the judges' period, the practice of Baal worship entered Jewish religious life. Judges 3, 7 New American Standard Bible so the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asheroth. The practice of Baal worship became widespread in Israel during the reign of Ahab, and the practice of Baal worship also affected Judah. Baal was a fertility god, thought to help the earth produce crops and people produce offspring in general. Various parts worshipped Baal in different methods, and Baal proved to be a highly universal god. Different religions emphasized different attributes of Baal and created unique sects based on them. In Numbers 25.3 and Judges 8.33, we can observe the existence of local deities such as Baal of Peor and Baal Berith. The word Baal appears infrequently in the Old Testament as a personal name. These local Baals were thought to be in charge of agriculture, creatures and humanity's fertility. It was crucial to winning their favor, especially in a place like Pal, where few natural streams or springs and rainfall is unpredictable. This led to adopting extreme forms into the cults, including ritual prostitution and child sacrifice. Jeremiah 7.9, New King James Version. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know? Baal is depicted in the sculptures wearing a helmet embellished with a bull's horns, a symbol of strength and fertility. In one hand he carries a club or mace, likely symbolizing thunder, while in the other hand he holds a spear decorated with leaves, which could signify both lightning and vegetation. In ancient times, Baal was regarded as the most dominant god, overshadowing El, who was perceived as feeble and inadequate. The Canaanites worshipped Baal as the sun god and as the storm god. He is usually depicted holding a lightning bolt, who defeated enemies and produced crops. They also worshipped him as a fertility god who provided children. 
Baal worship was rooted in sensuality and involved ritualistic prostitution in the temples. At times, appeasing Baal required human sacrifice, usually the firstborn of the one making the sacrifice. Jeremiah 19.5, King James Version They have built also the high places of Baal, to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came it into my mind. Baal's priests worshipped their deity with riotous rites that featured ecstatic shouts and self-inflicted harm. 1 Kings 18.28 Before the Hebrews entered the Promised Land, the Lord gave forewarned against glorifying Canaan's God. But Israel bent to idolism anyway. Deuteronomy 6, 14-15, King James Version Ye shall not go after other gods, of the gods of the people which are rounded about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee, and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. During the reign of Ahab and Jezebel, at the height of Baal worship in Israel, God directly confronted the paganism through his prophet Elijah. First, God showed that he, not Baal, controlled the rain by sending a drought lasting three and one half years. The stage was set for a showdown on Mount Carmel between 850 Baal prophets and one God prophet. How long will you waver between two opinions? Elijah challenged the audience. If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. Here was Elijah's dare. Let's have a competition. Let the God who is God respond with fire from heaven. That was a reasonable test. Baal the storm god should be able to send down some lightning. Elijah gave them every advantage before mocking their futile efforts. Baal's prophets spent hours pleading, shouting, and cutting themselves. But he didn't respond. Then Elijah prepared the sacrifice before asking God to show his people his glory. Fire fell and consumed the sacrifice, the water, and the altar as soon as he said his prayer. People fell to their knees yelling, The Lord! He is God! The Lord is God! They couldn't help but notice that God was alive and well. But the Lord wasn't done yet. He reactivated the rain spigot. Elijah prayed seven times in a row before the rain began to fall. Elijah, drenched, dashed down the mountain. He demonstrated that God is alive and well. God is alive and well. You can demonstrate it both privately and publicly in your life. Finally, in Matthew 12, 27, Jesus refers to Satan as Beelzebub, a reference to the Philistine god. The Baalim of the Old Testament were nothing more than demons masquerading as gods, and all the idol tree is ultimately devil worship. 1 Corinthians 10, 20 No, I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. Nebuchadnezzar's Statue this event is strange, as this is when King Nebuchadnezzar saw Jesus. Imagine you're a king 603 years before Christ, and you saw Jesus face to face. What would you do? Many people don't even know that Jesus was in the Old Testament. This event occurs in the book of Daniel. The events of the book take place in Babylon, a region that was ruled by Nebuchadnezzar, who was a proud and cruel tyrant who took great pleasure in torturing his victims. He ruled the ancient world as an absolute dictator. After subduing Assyria, he set his sights on Egypt, his principal adversary at the time. Because Judah was in the way, it would be necessary to get rid of it if he wanted to fulfill his ambition of ruling over a large empire. Nebuchadnezzar issued an order to have a large number of Jewish young men trained to serve him in the capacity of men of knowledge and wisdom. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were among those who were taken captive. They were known by the names Belshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Chaldean. 
The Image of God King Nebuchadnezzar gave the order for the creation of a colossal statue made of gold. The gold statue that Nebuchadnezzar had commissioned must have been magnificent. It stood 90 feet tall. It's possible that the king planned it so that he could consolidate his power by bringing together all levels of his officials for a grand ceremony. These rulers were to attend the dedication of the statue erected by King Nebuchadnezzar and fall face down in worship of it. Everyone who disobeyed this command ran the risk of being cast into a burning furnace and being burnt to a crisp. Everyone obeyed Nebuchadnezzar's orders because he was determined to establish himself not only as the uncontested political leader of Babylon, but also as the supreme religious authority in the city, or at the very least, almost everyone. Due to the fact that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were among the officials that were present at the massive gathering, a confrontation was unavoidable. Three of the men in the room did not bow down, even though everyone else in the room did. Many people cannot imagine that social pressure. It was not an easy fit. When Nebuchadnezzar found out about the situation, he immediately flew into a rage. It's surprising that he gave the accused a chance to respond to the charges leveled against them. That he did may indicate his regard for them. But make no mistake, the king would accept only one response, total concession. They had two options, either worship the enormous gold idol or perish in the fire. Despite his earlier praise for the Hebrew god, Nebuchadnezzar added, who is the god who can deliver you from my power? The king's question, as before, would be answered eventually. Daniel 3, 13 to 14. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, gave a command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image which I have set up? These valiant Jewish men defied the king's direct order and placed themselves in the hands of God. Their response is quite impressive. Daniel 3, 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. In other words, they said, we'd rather fear our god than your furnace any day. Even if he decided to let us burn, we will still serve the living god rather than your dead idol. Priceless. They preferred death to unfaithfulness to God and had no doubt planned for the possibility of this day for a long time. It's hard to fathom how angry Nebuchadnezzar was when his authority was challenged, but reportedly his face turned red with fury. In response, he ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than normal. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were tossed into the flames, the radiant heat was so great the men carrying them were killed. No doubt, wearing flammable clothing, the faithful Hebrews had no hope, unless hope itself intervened. Daniel 3, 19 to 25, New King James Version. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated, and he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments, and were cast in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the mist of the burning, fiery furnace. 
The king, Nebuchadnezzar, was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. When Nebuchadnezzar saw the men walking around in the fire, not only did he find it unbelievable that they were unharmed, but he also found it unbelievable that there were four of them. The fourth appeared to be God's son, implying that he was pre-incarnate Christ. Nebuchadnezzar tells us who the fourth person was, the Son of God. During the most difficult part of their ordeal, Jesus was there with them physically. Amid their ordeal in the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego may or may not have been aware that the Son of God was with them. Although there are times when we are conscious of Jesus' presence in our afflictions, and other times we are not, we should never doubt that He is present. God is able to strike with astonishment those individuals whose hearts are most hardened against Him and His people. He that made the soul can make his sword to approach to it, even to that of the greatest tyrant. When the king realized that the men he had sentenced had been divinely rescued, he summoned them, and not a single hair on their head had been scorched in the process. Being thrown into Nebuchadnezzar's deadly fire had proven to be a piece of cake. Number 6. Asherah Who was Asherah? or Ashtoreth. In the Bible, Asherah, or Ashtoreth, is the name of a pagan fertility goddess and a wooden cult object devoted to her. In the Bible, Asherah is almost always referred to as a sacred pole erected in honor of the fertility goddess. Scripture also references carved images of Asherah. The name Asherah means she who enriches. In Ugaritic literature, she was called Lady Asherah of the sea. She was believed to be worshipped in ancient Syria, Phoenicia, and Canaan. She was worshipped by the Phoenicians as Astarte, the Assyrians as Ishtar, and the Philistines as Asherah. As soon as Joshua died, Asherah worship plagued Israel due to Israel's complicated conquest of Canaan. Judges 2.13 so they abandoned the Lord and served Baal, the pagan god of the Canaanites, and the Asheroth. The nation of Israel was in a state of compromise in Judges 1. Initially, they had fought the pagan culture of the Canaanites. Then they feared it, and then they coexisted with it peacefully. Some might say that this was only a little disobedience compared to everything God had commanded. Still, God does not consider minor disobedience regarding his precise commands. People are always called to be different by God. It was God's standard for Israel to be different from the nations around them. But they had not obeyed. Sin always hurts. It always shackles. Joshua had faith in God and believed in his promises. Because of the leadership of Joshua, his generation knew the Lord. However, Generations come and go. The new generation didn't know God. The nation began with incomplete obedience and compromise. Instead of driving out the Canaanites, they were affected by that heathen nation's perverse pagan worship. Asherah was characterized by a limbless tree trunk planted in the ground. The trunk was typically carved into a symbolic representation of the goddess. As a result of the connection with carved trees, the places of Asherah worship were commonly called groves. He placed the carved Asherah pole he made in the temple among King Manasseh's evil acts. Considered the moon goddess, Asherah was often presented as a consort of Baal. Asherah was also worshipped as the goddess of love and war and sometimes linked with Anath, another Canaanite goddess. The cult of Asherah was notorious for its sensuality and involved ritual prostitution. In addition to this, divination and telling fortunes were also practices that the priests and priestesses of Asherah carried out. A detailed description of Asherah, or an Asherah pole, is not provided in the Old Testament. 
nor is the origin of Asherah worship described. In Canaan, sacred sites and altars were adorned with Asherah poles. 1 Kings 1423 For they also built for themselves high places to worship idols, and sacred pillars, and Asherim, for the goddess Asherah. These were on every high hill and under every luxuriant tree. The city of Tyre on the Mediterranean coast was home to the best cedars of Lebanon and was an important center for worshipping Asherah. The Jewish law explicitly forbade reverence of Asherah. Deuteronomy 16.21 You shall not plant for yourself an Asherah of any kind of tree or wood beside the altar of the Lord your God, which you shall make. Judges 6.26 depicts the collapse of an Asherah pole by using it to fuel the fire of a sacrificial offering to the Lord. Judges 6.26 And build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this mountain stronghold, with stones laid down in an orderly way. Then take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice using the wood of the Asherah, which you shall cut down. A famous Asherah pole stood in Samaria in the days of King Jehoash. Manasseh, king of Judah, heeded the despicable practices of pagan nations. He reconstructed the high places and set up altars for Baal and the Asherah pole. He sacrificed his own son in the fire, practiced sorcery and divination, and even made a carved image of Asherah and set it up in the temple. 2 Kings 21.7 he made a carved image of the goddess Asherah and set it up in the house, temple, of which the Lord said to David and to his son Solomon, In this house and in Jerusalem, in the tribe of Judah, which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. During the reign of Josiah, the high priest Hilkiah cleansed the temple of all images depicting the goddess Asherah. One reason Israel fell to the Assyrians was God's anger over their worship of Asherah and Baal. Despite God's clear instructions, Asherah worship was a perennial problem in Israel. As Solomon slipped into idolatry, one of the pagan deities he brought into the kingdom was Asherah, called the goddess of the Sidonians. At times, Israel experienced a revival, and King Josiah led notable crusades against Asherah worship. Number 7. Dagon Who was Dagon? The Bible describes Dagon, also known as Dagon, as one of the oldest deities in Mesopotamia, with evidence dating back to 3000 BC, and he was represented as a half-man, half-fish creature. The god Dagon was regarded as the father of all other gods, so he was worshipped widely in what we call the cradle of civilization where farming is thought to have first started. Also the area some call the Fertile Crescent. Dagon's statue looked like a gigantic man. Some representations of him have him looking like a merman, which is a human with fish features below the waist. Some scholars have referred to him as a fish god, which makes sense given his association with the Philistines and their location along the coast. In the Bible, the Philistines continued to worship Dagon during the time of the Judges, as well as during the reign of Samuel and Saul. As a biblical connection, ancient texts from the region connect Dagon as the father of Baal, another false god highlighted throughout later Old Testament history. What happened to Dagon in the Bible? There are two primary messages in the Old Testament that make reference to Dagon. The story can be found in Judges chapter 16 as a component of the Samson narrative. God chose Samson to be one of the deliverers or judges, and he used his renowned power to triumph over the Philistines at every stage of the conflict. The Philistines were unable to defeat him in combat, so they targeted his Achilles heel, his relationship with foreign women. The famed Delilah coaxed Samson's secret confession out of him and made him cut off his hair, leading to him being taken captive by the Philistines. As they worshipped Dagon and had a big party, they decided to humiliate Samson by putting out his eyes and making him work as a slave. Clearly, this was part of their worship of Dagon. 
When nations went to war in polytheistic cultures, it was also understood that their gods fought, and the Old Testament confirms this in many passages with Israel and other cultures. With Samson, the Philistines were making a statement. Due to the capture of Samson, they believed Dagon had beaten Jehovah, Samson's god, and therefore Dagon was stronger than the god of Israel. However, Samson made a plea to God and brought the entire structure down. Samson's plea to God to help him destroy the Philistines makes sense. God's assistance was not about Samson so much as proving which God was stronger. 1 Samuel 5 is where we find the next instance of Dagon being dealt with. The Philistines succeeded in stealing the Ark of the Covenant from its previous owners. In a manner identical to that which had occurred with Samson, the Philistines brought the Ark into the temple of one of their city-states, Ashdod. 1 Samuel 5, 1-7, Amplified Bible Then the Philistines took the Ark of God and they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. They took the Ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it beside the image of Dagon, their chief idol. When the people of Ashdod got up early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and returned him to his place. But when they got up early the next morning, behold, Dagon had again fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord, and his head and both palms of his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk portion of the idol of Dagon was left on him. This is the reason neither the priests of Dagon nor any who enter Dagon's house step on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. Then the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he caused them to be dumbfounded and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. When the men of Ashdod saw what happened, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is heavy on us and on Dagon our god. As a mark of their success, they displayed the ark by placing it at the base of the massive statue of Dagon. Dagon had beat Jehovah, right? It didn't last long. Then they sent the ark to the city of Ekron. Yes, you guessed correctly. More people developed tumors and passed away as a result. The people of Philistia pleaded with their officials to return the ark to Israel, and their leaders complied with their request, pointing out that they shouldn't be as obstinate as Pharaoh had been in Egypt. They loaded the ark onto a cart that was driven by two animals, and then they set it out. The oxen eventually made it back to Israel, even though there was no one driving them. Despite the worldview of the Philistines, the defeat of Israel wasn't a defeat of their God. God didn't need the army of Israel to fight for him. He won all on his own. It seems as if God has a sense of humor when we read the story of Dagon in the Bible. Here and in Isaiah, we see how God deals with false worship twice when he speaks of cutting wood for a fire and then bowing down to it. In the Isaiah excerpt, God said, He feeds on ashes. A deluded heart has led him astray, and he cannot deliver himself or say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? Dagon was worshipped in temples that could be found all over Mesopotamia. According to the Bible, the cities of Bethdagon, Gaza, and Ashdod were home to some of the most important temples. He was worshipped by offering offerings and participating in feasts. His temple is destroyed, his image is laid prostrate before the Ark of God and with his hands and face cut off, demonstrating that he is powerless to resist the God of the Israelites and his creature, which is a fish, complies with the will of God by swallowing and spitting out a prophet who is on his way to Dagon's people to tell them to repent and turn back to the true God. We need to be cautious about what we allow to infiltrate our lives. The Bible doesn't really mention if the Israelites engaged in Dagon worship. However, we know they dabbled with Dagon's gods, Baal and Asherah, so we can assume they threw a little Dagon in there. The seemingly innocuous can turn out to be insidious, so we must exercise extreme 